Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley. <coughs> Excuse me. And we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. There's a great deal of speculation in our day about how the Bible coincides with current events. We have people who have been speculating on these things all through history. And many of them are guided more by their own imaginations than they are by the text of Scripture. Uh, modern examples, uh, Harold Camping of Family Radio says that the rapture of the church is going to take place May 21st. And you can see billboards popping up around town and all over the country and even around the world saying the Bible guarantees it. Of course, this is the same Harold Camping who said that Jesus was coming back in 1994 and he was 99.9999999% sure. But now he's really, really sure. We have dealt with a lot of the strange speculation that we see in our day from people guided by uh, their own imaginations, people like Pat Robertson and Hal Lindsey. But over the last several weeks, we've been trying to basically do a survey of the book of Revelation to see what it actually says. Now, there's a great deal of content that we don't have time, especially in this kind of format, to, to dwell on. But what I've tried to do is to give you the context of Revelation first in terms of the Old Testament. That when we understand that God's covenant with Israel as the visible church, the ecclesia, as it was called in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament made 200 years before Christ, that covenant was conditional. God said, if you will obey me, here's how I'm going to bless you. If you won't obey me, these are the curses of the covenant that I'm going to bring upon you. And we saw how that played out over and over in the uh, prophets, that they were coming as messengers of the covenant and, and declaring that the judgments that they were seeing all around them were the judgments of God. They were curses for breaking that covenant. God never uh, completely did away with his people. He didn't put them away entirely. He maintained a remnant and he revisited them. We, have, we saw that through the Old Testament. We saw how that plays out in the New Testament. We saw how Jesus talked about the judgment that was coming on that generation, that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. So when you look at Daniel 9 and you see this, this uh, promise of the destruction of Jerusalem, you don't have to import the Antichrist into that passage. It is the Messiah. It is God himself who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, just as he had 600 years earlier under the Babylonians. We have people who confuse the, uh, what Christ does with the Antichrist. We see all these various things, but what is clear is that when they reject Christ and when they crucify him, they call upon themselves the curse of the covenant. And we saw how that has been played out in Jesus' warnings of the destruction that's coming, the Tower of Siloam, how this was an example that if you don't repent, you will all likewise perish. We've seen the Olivet Discourse and how these things fit together. We're going to come back to some of this. We've seen how Paul says that the wrath of God has come upon the unbelieving Jews to the uttermost. And we've started to deal with Revelation itself. The key point that I'm trying to get across here is that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not a book dealing with God's protection of the modern state of Israel. Uh, it is not uh, calling for its destruction or for our political support. It is dealing with something that to a great extent has been fulfilled. There's more to come. Not all of Revelation has been fulfilled, but it is, I believe, clearly John's version of the Olivet Discourse and the judgment on Jerusalem in that generation. When God, 40 years after Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled, 40 years later, not one stone was left on another of that temple. 
The Romans came and utterly destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, slaughtered, according to Josephus, 1.1 million Jews. Now, I've tried to carefully qualify this. This is not calling for uh, any uh, contempt of unbelieving Jews. Uh, it is, they're like any other group of unbelievers out there. But it is, it is a recognition that we are all part of fallen humanity. And apart from Jesus Christ, none of us can stand before a holy God. But to take the scriptures and to twist them and to take things that have been fulfilled and, and say, no, no, they haven't been fulfilled. We have to rebuild and redestroy the temple and then yet build it another time. When we find the scripture saying otherwise, it leads to confusion. It leads to people saying things like Jesus is coming back May 21st or as Hal Lindsey did, the world was going to end in thermonuclear war within 40 years or so of 1948. Um, Edgar Wisenant, we've talked about, he said that if Jesus didn't come back in 1988, the Bible wasn't true. The problem is not with the Bible. The, Bi the problem is with how people twist the Bible and ignore the major themes of Scripture. Now, when we look at Revelation, without all these self-appointed Bible teachers uh, creating this crazy quilt of proof text that they grab from here and here and here and here and put them all together, divorced from their context, what we see is what we began looking at last week. Revelation, at the beginning and at the end, makes very clear that these are things that are about to happen. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Shortly. Not 2,000 years hence, shortly. And then it goes on, blessed is he that readeth and they that uh, hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now remember, this is written to seven real churches. This is written just like Paul wrote a letter, letter to the Ephesians uh, and to the Thessalon wrote two letters to the Thessalonians, wrote letters to the Galatians. This is John's letter to seven literal churches. Now if this doesn't mean, and, and I could go through the word studies and show you that this is not something that is always at hand but, but still 2,000 years off, how would they have read this? In chapter 22 at the end, once again, we're told uh, Christ says he's coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Uh, I'm sorry, back up a verse. It says, And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And then it says, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. It says it twice at the beginning and twice at the end. And yet we are to believe that any reasonable person reading this is going to understand that it's thousands of years in the future. Well, then what's the theme? When you go through the first two chapters and you look at, uh, or first three chapters, you look at the fact that this is written to churches. They are suffering persecution. And that persecution is about to get a lot worse. What is the theme? The theme is of them overcoming persecution. This is meant to be a comfort that God is the one who is in control of all these events that they're seeing take place around them. That these things shouldn't come as a surprise as if there's some strange thing happening and God just can't do anything about it. They're to understand that all of the things that are going to be happening are for a purpose. Now understand, we've looked at the, we've looked at the internal evidence in terms of the fact that this is written uh, at the time of the Roman Empire. It talks of seven kings. Five are no more, one is, and one will be for a short time. Every evidence is that this is during the time of Nero. What does Nero do? Nero 
is the one who changed the policy of the Roman Empire. All through the book of Acts you see persecution led by the Jews and they are trying to involve the Romans in persecuting the church. You have Paul dragged before uh, Gallio, uh, the brother of Seneca, and you have uh, over and over the, the Roman authorities are used to persecute the church, or at least there's an attempt to, but the Romans are at best reluctant. And like Gallio and these others, they don't participate willingly. To a great extent, they are protectors of the church because the Romans viewed Christianity as just one more form of Judaism. You had Pharisees, Sadducees, you had um, other groups out the Essenes and others. They thought, okay, this is just one more sect of Judaism. We're not going to get dragged into this kind of uh, internecine squabbling. But in 64 AD, Nero did something different. Nero blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome. According to Roman historians, it was probably Nero himself who set fire to Rome. And Nero you know, famously fiddled while Rome burned, actually he was playing his, his lyre. But he blames the Christians and he outlaws Christianity. No longer was Christianity a legal, a, a licit religion. It, is an Ill, it became an illicit religion, illegal. From the time of Nero until the time of Constantine, two and a half centuries later, it was a death sentence, potentially, for anyone to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. All that is coming to pass. But the ones who had stirred up so much persecution of the church and had helped bring some of this about were the unbelieving Jews. And the reality is they do stir up the Roman Empire against the Christians, but very quickly Rome turns on them as well. Interestingly, the persecution under Nero lasts about 42 months. We'll see the significance of that later. Nero ends up dying by his own hand. During the reign of Nero, you have the beginning of the Jewish War, which from the beginning of that until the destruction of Jerusalem is roughly 42 months. We'll see how all these things fit together. Now, there's a lot of speculation about where people try to, to take things and force this to mean this and all these other things, but the, the main theme I want to try to show you is that this is about the judgment of the unbelieving people of Israel. Now understand, all unbelievers are judged. Any failures of any unbelieving Jew, they are condemnations of their human nature, not of their race, not of their nationality or race. But when we look at Scripture, we see that there are judgments if we do not tremble at God's word, if we do not seek him while he may be found, if we don't come to him in peace. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It shows him in all his glory. It shows him as, as the, the lamb that was slain. It also shows him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It shows him riding on the white horse uh, with a sword going out of his mouth, destroying his enemies. It shows him in his love and care for his people. It shows him as the one in, whom, in whose presence those that receive the mark of the beast are tormented. They are tormented in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. It shows Christ in the fullest revelation of who he is. And this is scary for modern audiences because, honestly, I think a lot of people would prefer that it was talking about the birthmark on Gorbachev's head or something like this. Because so long as they're dealing with people, so long as they're dealing with newspaper events, they don't have to really worry about God. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the focus. And what we see in the book of Revelation is that the persecution by unbelieving Jews of the church is going to come back on them. 
um, in Revelation 2, 9, the church there is comforted about the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. God's going to judge them. Revelation 3, 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and know that I have loved thee. The church. It's not that the church has replaced Israel. It is that the church is Israel. It's that the natural branches have been largely broken off for unbelief. We've been grafted in. We have become partakers of those promises. Ephesians 2, we who were strangers and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, we who were afar off, we've been brought near. Of the two, God has made one man. We are children of Abraham through faith. But the sons, of, the sons of the kingdom have largely been cast into outer darkness because they don't believe. Now we, talked, we began talking last, uh, last week about how this is very clearly directed not at God's protection of unbelieving Israel, but His judgment of them. Because when it talks in Revelation 11, we're going to deal with this in uh, the future in more detail. The death of the two witnesses, it says in verse 8 of chapter 11, their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which, is, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. It is Jerusalem that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. Remember chapter 1. Who is it that's going to see Him coming? It is even those who pierced Him. And when we look at places like uh, Isaiah 19 and others, we, I think that we have clearly a coming in judgment, just as God came in the Old Testament in judgment. What you have here is a contrast between the harlot which all through the Old Testament is unbelieving Israel and the bride. Israel was the bride, but she became a harlot. The church includes believing Jews and believing Gentiles. But unbelieving Israel is the harlot. That's the contrast. Now, how do we say that Israel's the harlot. Revelation 18 verses 15 through 16, this is where we left off last week. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now, does that sound like Israel? Well, let's press on. Verse 24, describing the harlot, it says there, And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. You remember Matthew 23? We, we talked about this in, in some depth last week. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you adorn the tombs of the prophets and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in their blood. But you, were, you bear witness against yourselves. You are the sons of those who killed the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from righteous Abel to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you killed between the altar and the temple. Who is, which city is... Uh, filled with the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all those that were slain on the earth. It's Jerusalem. Now, uh, there's a significance in the verse that I read just before in, in chapter 18 where she's described as being dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Josephus, the first century historian who, who, who was there, he described the veil of the Holy of Holies, 
Remember at the crucifixion of Christ, it was rent from top to bottom. And here's an interesting thing. He says, it was a Babylonian curtain embroidered with blue and fine linen and scarlet and purple and of a contexture that was truly wonderful. This is the description of the temple. We have this contrast, just like you see in Galatians, between the Jerusalem that is below, that is in bondage with her children, and the Jerusalem that is above, that is free. You see this theme all through the New Testament, and you see it here. I believe that what's being described here in terms of the harlot is clearly in reference to Jerusalem. And we're going to see more of why that, that's the case. Now, just as, as an aside, one of the things that so many people seem to hold to in our modern American evangelical churches is the rapture, the preacher rapture. And there are people who believe that if you don't believe that, you just don't believe the Bible. I've been told that more times than I can count. Uh, it's a very unfortunate because no one before 1830 believed it. I challenge you to, I mean, there, there are some claims of um, pseudo Ephraim and I, uh, a pastor named Morgan who said something that might possibly be that, but that's it, two people. Supposedly we've had God's word, we've had his spirit, but we never understood this until a schismatic nut by the name of um, John Nelson Darby uh, came up with it in 1830. The reality is the end of this whole section dealing with the church, it says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on, in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. The th message of Revelation is overcoming. It's not escape. It's not that, that you can uh, charge up your credit cards because you'll never have to pay them off. You can, you can escape all responsibility. You're never going to have to suffer. It's the one who overcomes. There are going to be trials. And you have to be steadfast. That's not a very popular message these days. That's one of the reasons I think the rapture is so popular. Is you, um, you, you, you don't have to suffer, and there's a second chance. You can leave a... You can leave a bunch of Tim LaHaye books in a safety deposit box for your kids, and then they'll really know that it's all true. I don't see any second chances in Scripture. You gotta, today's the day of salvation. Well, now we come to Revelation 4, and we're going to see how this ties into this whole theme of judgment on Jerusalem. I'm going to read the whole chapter to you here out of the King James. It says, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, and said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat uh, was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, 
to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Unfortunately, the all too typical evangelical focus on this is the voice sounded like a trumpet. Well, that must be the resurrection. This must be the rapture. It says, come up hither. Um, back in chapter 1, the voice there sounded like a trumpet too. God's voice sounds like a trumpet numerous times in Scripture. It's not necessarily the final trumpet. And the fact that he tells John to come up hither doesn't describe a rapture. Um, he's giving him a perspective, as we'll see, of God's throne in heaven. And it is, it's, it's not any of these strange things that you often will hear. Uh, people will tell you, well, the church isn't mentioned any time after this. Well, Jesus isn't specifically mentioned. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb that was slain, they're mentioned, but Jesus by name. But people say, well, the church isn't mentioned by name. Well, similarly, we're just as it's clear as talking about Jesus, uh, the church is mentioned. This is no proof text for anything uh, re regarding a preacher rapture of the church. But what is being described here? It is the throne of God. And this throne, the description of it is something that those who are familiar with the Old Testament would have immediately recognized. Remember, this is the days before television and the internet, uh, before all the various distractions that have made us feel very content with a very superficial knowledge of the Bible. The audience was made up of people who, whose very lives were at stake and they fed on the Bible. Well, this description of the four beasts uh, and this throne, it's right out of Ezekiel chapter 1. It's the vision of the wheel within the wheel. It is the picture of God's throne being envisioned there. And he describes the same four beasts. And then in verses 26 through 28, he says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it, upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. And it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. Now I want to, I want to flesh this out, but I want to go ahead and open up the phone lines. Uh, if you'd like to join in the conversation, what is the book of Revelation all about? What, you know, we're not going to get into all the speculations, all the minutia, but what are the major themes? We invite you to call in. The phone number here is 801-973-8820. That's 801-973-8820. Um, the four living creatures, the throne, the rainbow, all these things you find in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4. Is it just a pa I mean, is it just this passing resemblance of God's chariot throne? No, there's a context in Ezekiel. Because all this imagery of, of God being surrounded by the cloud with lightning and, and thunder and all these things, the context in Ezekiel is God's judgment on Israel. The very next verses after the description I read you, the beginning of chapter 2, it says, um, after he heard the voice of one that spake, and he said unto me, Son of man, this is Ezekiel 2. Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me. 
when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said to, unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. God dwelling in the cloud, the lightning, the thunder, it's, it's somewhat reminiscent of Sinai. And the scroll that you see in the next chapter is written on both sides, just like the Ten Commandments. There are other parallels that we'll get into. But what's the major context? It is not just that God is sitting on a throne. He's sitting on a throne with wheels. He's sitting on a throne that is God coming in judgment. It is, it's known, uh, many theologians, you, you'll hear the term, the chariot throne of God. It is being born by these four creatures. The context in Ezekiel is, here is this throne with the four living creatures, the rainbow, all these various things, same identical creatures, same rainbow, same throne. The context in the old one was the judgment on unbelieving Israel. What's the context in the new? Those who say they are Jews and are not, that city that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. You notice that they, the six creatures are also described as having six wings. I hope that jars your memory. Uh, they're crying, holy, holy, holy. I hope it reminds you of Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, just like in Revelation 4. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So you've got holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Uh, Revelation 4. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Six wings on both of them. Should be something that sort of jumps out in our memories. Once again, what's the context? This isn't just a description that, so, you know, oh, by the way, I had this vision, and here's what it was, and it's completely devoid of any kind of import. The context in Isaiah is, on the, is about the judgment of Israel for their unbelief. You skip ahead in chapter 6. You remember the, what happens. After seeing this vision of the holiness of God, Isaiah says, Woe is me, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. The voice goes from the throne to take a coal from the altar, an angel goes and takes a coal from off the altar, touches it to his lips and pronounces him clean. God says, who will I send? Isaiah says, send me. Verses 9 through 11 describe what follows. It says there, And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Once again, this, this imagery of, of the, the chariot throne of God, the rainbow, the four creatures, it's all leading up to judgment of Israel. Isaiah 6, the six wings crying, holy, holy, holy. The immediate context, judgment on Israel. And when you go through these, these books, it's not just the immediate context, it's the overall context. 
about the judgment that is coming. Now, there are promises held out for the future as well, but there's judgments that are the context all around these things. At the very beginning of Isaiah's prophecy, he says um, there in uh, chapter 1, we'll, uh, we won't read all the verses, but in chapter 1, verses 2 through 21, it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. And then skipping ahead a few verses, And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and, of, and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. And then skipping ahead a few verses, how is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. It is very clear that, that Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt in Revelation, just as she's called Sodom here. Could she be Babylon as well? Yes. We've seen the description of Josephus. We see that, 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 that city, the harlot, is filled with the blood of the prophets and the saints. I think it's very clear. Jesus himself applies this prophecy of judgment from Isaiah 6 on that current generation. We'll look at that in a moment, but I'll go ahead and squeeze in our first call. We have Randy from Colville. Randy, good to have you with us. Randy? Hello? You're on the air. I'm on the air? You're on okay, the air. Okay, um, I had a question. Did she preempt you at all, or? No, go ahead. Okay, what I was asking was, uh, my sister, I asked her, I said, why wouldn't you have our mother, who's 92, she's 63, my sister is 63, and I'm 58, and I asked her, why wouldn't you have our mother over for Easter Sunday to have dinner and at least uh, get together? And she goes, well, read the Bible. And I said, I don't know of any verse in the Bible that says you shouldn't share Easter Sunday with your family. Can you give me a verse that might... <laughs> you picked that because she just said, read the Bible. It was pretty vague. Oh. Well, Randy, um, I guess somewhat on subject. It, uh, basically, most people come to the Bible like a smorgasbord. They want to pick and choose what suits them and ignore the rest. They want to change the Bible to suit them. They don't want to be changed by God's Word. They don't want to be confronted by their own sins, their own responsibilities. Uh, you know, I don't know all the, 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 the intricate details, and, the, and television is not a great place to get into those kind of details, but, um, you know, well, I, I, have, pagan, I, have, I, I have unbelieving... Is type of celebration for celebrating that, that Christ rose again? You know, and that is not a, like, not a celebration, but it's something to share with your loved ones. Yeah, I mean, uh, we all have unbelieving family members. Uh, we don't have to, um, we don't have to throw rocks at them. Uh, we can actually uh, be cordial to them. Uh, as far as celebration of of uh, Easter, uh, I don't know if your sister was upset that some of these things come over from pagan origins uh, and been, have been mixed with Christian traditions. Basically. Um, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus 52 times a year, not, not just once. Um, I don't know whether your sister was getting fired up. Um, you know, there are things that have become Christian traditions that have uh, pagan 
influence. Uh, we need to be aware of that and avoid them. Well, but, sure, like Easter egg hunts and that sort of thing are kind of our, you know, we've, we've grown to those traditions. Again, I live in Colville, and I didn't see anybody have an Easter egg hunt. <laughs> well, it's, it's becoming politically incorrect. Um, oh, yeah, I know, because it's a very Mormon town. Well, no, I mean, it's just... Well, there's not only that, but I mean, there's also, um, it's politically incorrect. Do Mormons to, celebrate to, Easter? Uh, I believe so. I mean, I'm not. I'm, uh, well, well, I mean, uh, they say they're uh, Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, and yet I, I don't see the uh, Bible anywhere around any of the people here. Uh, I see the Book of Mormon, which to me is false. Well, I mean,. I, I could play. I could. I could play devil's advocate and, and say, well, they carry their quads and I know, you know, you're, things like you're that. On, you got to be politically correct, like but, you said. But, but anyway, thank you. I uh, again, I ask my sister. Well, what verse says that? Okay. Well, thank you for calling, Randy. Hey, I appreciate your time. Have a great night. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you for being on television. Okay. Um, honestly, I wish more evangelicals read their Bibles. Um, I think I mentioned it several weeks ago, they did a survey 20 years ago. They asked uh, high school seniors, I believe it was, across the country, answer one of these three questions. Name the four Gospels, how many disciples did Jesus have, or what event is celebrated by Easter? 80% couldn't answer any of the three. I've known people who have grown up in churches, um, gone to church schools, and gone to college, uh, they hold down responsible jobs, and they can't answer any of the three. 81% couldn't, couldn't name one of the Ten Commandments. Only 4% could name all ten. And it didn't have to be in any order or the whole form, just the simplest version of them. Um, honestly, I don't think we have a whole lot of room to throw rocks at Mormons when evangelicals who actually claim to believe the Bible don't bother to actually study it. But... Um, of course, I have to be I have to um, qualify my comments here. I was going off last week and, and kept quoting Revelation. Excuse me, Romans thirteen. When I meant to say Romans eleven, and uh, that's a fun thing to do on live TV. But anyway, if you'd like to join in the conversation, if you have a question, the the thrust of all this is Jesus wins. Jesus is going to overcome all his enemies. He's going to build his church. We're going to see the ties to Zechariah and the, and the rebuilding of the temple in spite of all the opposition of the Samaritans and everyone else. We're going to see that that same imagery is applied that in spite of all the opposition of the Jews, the Romans, and everyone else, Christ is going to build his church. And rather than this being something to be scary, this is meant to be a comfort to God's people. It's meant to be an encouragement. That when you, when you turn on Alex Jones or um, Glenn Beck or whoever is telling you about the great conspiracy this time or that, you know, there are, there are conspiracies in the world. There are evil people, and they actually do get together behind closed doors and do evil things. The reality is they don't have to be nearly as coordinated as so many people think because they're evil. Um, their unity is found in their opposition to God. It wasn't that just one day some otherwise nice people got together in 1776 and said, let's take over the world. There are evil people who do evil things, but God's in control. And just like in Psalm 2, God laughs at them all. God is going to do what he wants to do. And people sit behind closed doors, trembling at the latest news that they get off uh, the news about, oh, they're going to do it to us now. That's one of the reasons I'm focusing on Revelation, because... Christ is shown to be a conqueror. It's this imagery of Christ going forth to conquer, the gates of hell being besieged by the church militant that was the impulse that drove missionaries all over the world to tell them about Jesus Christ. We, we have a picture at the beginning of our show goes back um, nearly a, a millennia and a half to Boniface. He was a missionary who, who went to the Norse, the people who were worshiping the, the uh, gods of Odin and uh, Thor and these others. 
and he takes out an axe and he chops down the sacred oak of Thor and he stands on the stump and he says, if Thor is a god, let him deal with me. But I'm going to, dis I'm going to declare Jesus Christ to you. This isn't a, a triumphalistic kind of thing. Yes, there's humility. Yes, all these other things. But we're called to the way of the cross. We're called to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And yet at the same time, the comfort here is that when Jesus ascends up to heaven, the Great Commission is preceded not by the word go, but instead by all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. We don't have to think like Franklin Graham that when Hurricane Katrina hit, well, that's, that's Satan. God, God had nothing to do with that. Satan's the God of this world. And the picture is Jesus sitting up in heaven, twiddling his thumbs, really you know, wringing his hands, wishing that he could do something, but he can't. We literally had um, the Unitarian Universalist um, lady with us a few weeks ago who said, God has no hands but ours. And unfortunately, a whole lot of evangelicals seem to believe that. No, God wins. And the focus here is Christ's protection of his church. That's the focus. Jews and Gentiles in that church, but it's at the church. The Jerusalem that is below is in bondage with her children. The wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost, Paul tells the Thessalonians. Well, as I said, if you'd like to squeeze, if you'd like to uh, call in before our time runs out, the phone number here, 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Revelation 4 is talking about the chariot throne of God. Um, you have all this imagery. It draws from Ezekiel 1, also from Isaiah 6. That portion of Isaiah 6, talking about judgment, Jesus applies it to that generation. In Matthew 13, verses 10 through 15, Jesus' disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given and he shall have more abundance. But, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So many people think that parables were given to make things more clear. Jesus says no. He speaks to them in parables to hide the truth, because it's not been given to them. It's judgment. Remember just three chapters earlier, he says, Woe to you, Capernaum. Woe, woe to you, Bethsaida. He tells them it'd be, it's going to be more tolerable for, for the land of Tyre and Sidon. It's going to be more tolerable for, for the land of Sodom than for them. When you have this covenant and God says, if you will not obey me, these are the judgments I'm going to bring. And you see these judgments spelled out in Revelation. And just like in Leviticus, seven times more, and seven times more, and seven times more, Leviticus 26. That city, that great city that is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt. That great city that's the, the harlot. That's filled with the blood of the prophets. I think it's very clear that what you have is judgment. 
I don't really have time to get into chapter 5 this evening, but I hope that chapter 4 shows you that it fits with the other first three chapters. That this is talking about the judgment that was coming in that generation on Jerusalem. And when you hear Glenn Beck and a whole host of other people say, this is what's in the book of Revelation. It's coming to pass. They're all coming against Israel. It's all going to be this and that and the other. Don't take their word for it. Don't take my word for it. How about you read the Bible for yourself and don't start in Revelation and don't start in Matthew, start in Genesis. Most people clip right on through Genesis. They get into Exodus and for the first two thirds they are doing pretty well. Then it gets into all the details of the tabernacle and they begin to bog down. They get into Leviticus and Leviticus, if you don't know um, the context, it can get really confusing. And then maybe they press on through to the book of Numbers, um, that great desert that seems to um, claim so many readers of the Bible. When you're getting into genealogies and things like that, a lot of people fall away. But here's a, here's, here's a novel concept. Bible is the Word of God. And some of these portions, such as Leviticus, Numbers, some of Deuteronomy, they can be a little bit hard. But uh, you press on through, and then you find out you come out the other side. And what becomes clear is that God is not a means to our end. God is the end. God is scary. This is the God who, who, who dwells in unapproachable light. This is the God whom the holy angels have to cover their own faces because He is so holy and glorious. And yet, as as scary as it is, this is the God who drowns the whole world. This is the God that, is, that comes in judgment against the nations and against his own people, who is portrayed in, in, in very uh, vivid detail of his wrath and judgment. It is this God who is nailed to a cross for his enemies. It is Jesus Christ, John says in John chapter 12, that was on that throne that the angels said, Holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with his glory. He is the one that hung on that cross and prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And there was forgiveness offered to Israel, and there still is. But what, when they, what happens when they reject it? And what happens to everybody else when they reject it? And what happens to people who play games with God and think that they're right with God because they've walked an aisle and prayed a prayer, and yet they live like a pagan? And they show that their hearts are unchanged. Behold the goodness and severity of God. That's what you see in Revelation because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The same one that was hung on that cross is the same one that those who receive the mark in Revelation 14 are tormented in His presence. It's the same one that the kings, the great ones, all the people of the earth cry out in chapter 6, to the mountains fall on us and hide us from the wrath of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come and who can stand? Well, we've run out of time for this week. We're going to have an interview next week. Um, the pastor of Wasatch Presbyterian, the uh, mainline church that is giving away Qurans, was in Friday's paper, uh, has agreed to come on the show and talk about that. Uh, we're going to see, um, we're going to open up to phone calls and um, hopefully have a good discussion on that. 
and we hope to have some other guests in the near weeks, but we're going to press on with this as time allows. The show is sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church. We are a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna. Uh, we have Bible studies in various places that we invite you uh, down in Utah County and also we're hopefully uh, getting one organized up in Heber if you know of anyone that might be interested in either of those. Tuesday of next week we will have the organization of Berean Presbyterian in Ogden. That's at 6.30 p.m. They meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. at 3350 Harrison Boulevard. That's where the organization service is going to be as well. We invite you to come and join us. Um, they're going to be particularized as a separate congregation with their own elders, and we rejoice in that. For more information, you can go to our website, ChristPres.net, or call us at 801-969-7948. Till next week, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night.